Here you see two different spheres. Uh, we'll say they're both metal spheres. So they're each of different uh, radius. The radius of sphere A is 50 centimeters, and the radius of sphere B is 25 centimeters. Sphere A carries a positive charge of 8 microcoulombs, and sphere B carries a negative charge of uh, negative 2 microcoulombs. So let's see if we can solve for a few different quantities. First of all, what's the electric field strength just outside of sphere A? So at some point, just barely beyond the surface. So keep in mind, if you have any sphere Q, for example, and some point P that's outside of the sphere, and we find electric field, we'll say E out, is equal to K Q over R squared. Of course, E in, if the sphere is made out of metal, is equal to zero. Uh, and you also know that the electric potential at some point outside the sphere is equal to KQ over R. If it's made out of metal, the electric potential inside is equal to a constant value. After all, electric field is dV dS, so if the electric field is zero inside, that means the electric potential must be a constant. Okay, so in this problem we're not really concerned with the electric field or the electric potential at points inside of the sphere. We're concerned with the electric field and the electric potential at points just outside of the sphere. So to answer this first question, we just calculate E is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared times 8 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs divided by 0 0.5 meters quantity squared. Square meters cancel out one of the coulombs cancels out. We're left with newtons per coulomb. This is the way we express electric field. We get 288,000 newtons per coulomb. What's the electric potential at the surface of sphere A? So we use the equation KQ over R. 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared times 8 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs divided by 0 0.5 meters. Okay, so this time meters don't completely cancel out one of them, so we have Newton meters per coulomb squared. Let's see, but that coulomb cancels out. So we're left with Newton meters per coulomb, but a Newton meter is a joule. So we're getting joules per coulomb, or better known as volts. Okay, so this works out. So again, we grab a calculator. And we get 144,000 volts. What's the electric field strength just outside the surface of sphere B? So now we're looking at a point right here. And notice this figure is not drawn to scale. The radius of sphere A is 0 0.5 meters. The radius of sphere B is 0 0.25 meters. And we're told that they're separated by 5 meters. Okay, okay. So, I found this on the web. Um, so to find the electric field strength just outside the surface of sphere B, again we use the equation E equals KQ over R squared. So 9 times 10 to the 9th times 2 times 10 to the negative 6th 
divided by 0 0.25 quantity squared. And we get 288,000 newtons per coulomb. So that's just a coincidence um, that they both have the same electric field. That's just a coincidence of the given values of charge and radius. What's the electric potential of the surface of sphere B? Well, if they both have the electric field, then does that guarantee they both have the same electric potential? Let's see. 9 times 10 to the 9th times negative 2 times 10 to the negative 6th divided by 0 0.25. Notice when I'm calculating for electric field, even though the charge is negative, I don't enter a negative value. But when I'm calculating for electric potential, if the charge is negative, I do. Hopefully you understand the reason for that. right? Because electric field is a vector quantity, I treat negatives by considering the direction uh, of the field. But because electric potential is a scalar quantity, and the only way to account for the difference between positive and negative is in the magnitude. Okay, so we get that the electric potential is 72,000 joules per coulomb, or 72,000 volts. So uh, the answer is no, just because two spheres have the same electric field, no, they do not have the same electric potential. Oh, and by the way, this is negative 72,000, right? Okay. What if we took a wire, attached it to sphere A, a really long wire that's almost five meters long, and we also touch it to sphere B. So now there's a conducting path that connects the two metal spheres. So charge is going to end up transferring between the two spheres. And I want you to take some time and see if you can figure out which of the following is the correct answer. So electrons will flow from sphere A to sphere B until the electric field just outside of both spheres is equal in magnitude. Now, in this problem, if that were the correct answer, that means no charge will flow because the electric field outside of both spheres already is equal, 288,000 newtons per coulomb. Or is it correct to say that electrons will flow from sphere B to sphere A until each sphere has the same charge on it? So right now, one has a charge of 8 microcoulombs, the other negative 2 microcoulombs. So is charge going to transfer until they each have the same amount of charge? Or is it C? Will electrons flow from sphere B to sphere A until the electric potential at the surface of each sphere is equal. So right now they don't have the same electric potential. One is positive 144,000 volts, the other is negative 72,000 volts. Or is the correct answer D, electrons will flow from sphere A to sphere B until they each have the same amount of charge. So almost the same description uh, in case B and D, it's just a matter of which direction are electrons flowing. Okay, take some time, reread those, and consider it. You can press pause, uh, and once you've decided on the correct answer, then you can unpause and resume this video. Okay, so hopefully you figured it out. If you said the answer is C, then I say, well done. That's the whole idea of electrostatic equilibrium. When there's no potential difference between the ends of a wire, then no charge flows. But if one end of the wire is at a, a higher potential, right? You know, this is the high potential. It's positive 144,000 volts. And this end is the low potential. It's at negative 72,000 volts. That's kind of like um, the conduction of heat in a wire. Let's say you uh, had a maybe a metal hanger and you were using that to roast marshmallows over a campfire.
right? That you're holding on to this end. So you've got a high temperature and you've got a low temperature. So which way will heat flow? Heat will flow from high temperature to low temperature. Or likewise, So a, a difference in temperature is the driver for the flow of heat uh, in a metal. What if you had a water pipe? And both ends of the water pipe are at extremely high pressure. Well, then no water is going to flow at all. It's not the fact that you have high pressure that makes water flow. It's whether or not you have a difference in pressure. So if you have a relatively high pressure and a relatively low pressure, then again, water or liquid will flow from a high pressure to low. So differences in pressure are the driver for the flow of fluid through a pipe. Differences in temperature are the driver for the flow of heat. Uh, differences in electric potential are the drivers, so to speak, for the flow of electric charge through a wire. So once these uh, two spheres have the same electric potential at each surface, then charge no longer flows, and at that point we'll have reached an electrostatic equilibrium. So let's figure out, by the time everything is said and done, how much charge will exist on each of the two spheres. So as it is right now, the net amount of charge, or maybe we'll just call that capital Q, right? We'll say capital Q represents the net charge of this system. Well, that's equal to positive 8 microcoulombs plus negative 2 microcoulombs, so this is obviously 6 microcoulombs. You might think then, by the time we reach equilibrium, this one will have 3 microcoulombs, this one will have 3 microcoulombs. But that would be um, what's being suggested in cases B and D, that charge will flow until they each have the same charge, and that's not it. Because the two spheres have different radii, then they don't have the same electric potential if they have the same charge. The larger one's going to have more of the total six microcoulombs, and the smaller one will have less. In fact, we can just say that the electric potential on sphere A has to equal the electric potential on sphere B once we reach equilibrium. So we'll make that a starting point of our solution. And then we just need to substitute the known equation for electric potential. So this is KQA divided by R A. This is K Q B divided by R B. And now you might think I'm going to plug in for Q A 8 microcoulombs. But what I mean is the charge on Q A once electrostatic equilibrium is achieved. So we don't know what this is. In fact, instead of calling it Q A, I think I'll just call it Q and know that once we reach equilibrium, Q represents the charge on sphere A. And then instead of calling this QB, wouldn't you agree that this would have to be the total charge in the system minus the amount of charge that's on sphere A? So instead of calling this QA, we're just going to call it Q. Instead of calling this QB, we am say that has to be the total system minus whatever charge is on sphere A, right? So uh, the next step of the solution here, we can cancel out the K on both sides of the equation. So Q divided by 50 centimeters is equal to capital Q minus Q divided by 25 centimeters. So um, and cancel out the units of centimeters. Six minus Q divided by Q is equal to twenty-five over fifty. Of course, this is what we get by cross multiplying and substituting six for capital Q. So 6 minus Q is equal to 0 0.5 Q.
So the charge on sphere A must be equal to 6 microcoulombs divided by 1.5, or in other words, 4 microcoulombs, which means the charge on sphere B must be equal to 6 microcoulombs minus 4 microcoulombs for 2 microcoulombs. So when it's all said and done, sphere A is going to have positive 4 microcoulombs, and sphere B is going to have positive 2 microcoulombs. So the total charge on this whole system is still positive 6 microcoulombs, and the electric potential at the surface of each, well, let's figure out and make sure we've got this right, 9 times 10 to the 9th times 4 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 0 0.5 versus 9 times 10 to the 9th times 2 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 0 0.25. And this comes out to positive 72,000 volts, just as this one comes out to positive 72,000 volts. So yeah, they've reached the same electric potential. Now, is this right? Have electrons flowed from sphere B to sphere A? Let's see. So yeah, remember, initially sphere B was negative. So as electrons, which are negatively charged objects, flow this way across the wire, then gradually this charge becomes less and less negative until eventually it reaches a charge of zero. And then as more electrons continue to flow from sphere B to sphere A, uh, the lack of electrons makes this sphere start to change from negative into positive until ultimately, as we've solved for, Sphere A has a charge of positive 4, and B has a charge of positive 2 microcoulombs. So there you have it. This must be the case. Anytime conducting objects have reached electrostatic equilibrium, the electric potential at the surface of each of the conducting objects must be equal. Thanks for watching.